of my immediate family. My brother, my, my oldest sister has gone on to be with the Lord, and if she didn't make it, it ain't going to need me trying. But she's already gone on to be with the Lord. My youngest sister, uh, either the Lord's going to take her or I am. Uh, <laughs> but I, my mom and dad both, both uh, went to be with the Lord before I was 30 years old. And I am proud to stand before you today knowing that my family is saved. And we talked uh, Tuesday night and Thursday night at UBTC as I, as, um, I was going, going over this with a class. John Wesley said this, I was saved, I am saved, and I will be saved. Now this confuses people. But what he was saying was, I was saved many years ago. The Lord Jesus Christ came into my heart and changed my life. He said, I am saved. Paul, in the scripture writing, says, I die daily. It's a daily walk with the Lord. Amen. Every day you've got to renew your commitment. Amen. And just like every day you should tell your spouse, at some point in time during the day you love her. And don't wait until it's after you've done something dumb. Amen. We need to renew our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ every single day. Amen. Letting Him know we love Him. And then we will be saved. There's a day coming, Amen. and I don't believe it, it's very far off, that we will be saved from all sin and all temptation. All of, the, all of the things that the earth, you know, a lot of people say, man, I wish I could have, could have known what it was like to be in the Garden of Eden where Adam, where Adam was with no sin. If you'll hang in there, baby, you'll make it, and you'll find out exactly how God designed it, and we'll get to live on this earth again in total total victory. And I thank the Lord for that promise. I said all that because I'm going to say some things I know today might upset the apple cart. The family's under attack. There's some things going on in this country that I absolutely despise. And I'm going to go ahead and, and preach the messages while I can until the government comes in and they probably have people have people sitting in the churches to make sure the preacher don't say nothing against this or this or this and everything, or they're going to arrest him. I want all of you people to study for prison ministry. Because I, I ain't shutting up. I'm too old to quit. I'm too old to stop. This word is filled with truth. Amen. And it's not, it's not optionable. Amen. It's not for you to take what you want and do with it. And it's not for you to eliminate what you don't like. You know, this is, this is not mixed vegetables. Seriously. This is not mixed vegetables. You know, you, you go through it and you say... I like the English peas, so I'm not eating them carrots. Right? Okay. That's not the way it works with the Bible. Either this Bible is whole truth or it's no truth. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture that I read many times at weddings. And it's found in Mark chapter 10. It's written in red. Which means you better pay attention. Amen. These are the words of Jesus Christ, and He does not mince words here. Matter of fact, He never did. Amen. Mark 10, 6 through 9 says this But from the beginning of creation, of the creation, God made them male and female. Thank you, Jesus. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Amen. Or as King James says in the original version, put asunder. There's sharp and loud voices out there 
in our society today and all over the world that are predicting and absolutely promoting, believe it or not, the end of the family as we have known it. Many are saying the family will never be as it has been before. Articles such as, is this the last married generation? Is this the last married generation? Proclaim the death of the family. It's going to get even quieter in here. More than half of all couples living together in the United States are not married. Not married. And let me just throw this in here for you guys. If she's good enough to sleep with, she's good enough to marry. Amen. So buck up, marry her. Amen. And the same thing goes with you ladies. Well, what if they're not good to me? What if? What if? I'm going to say some things here today, and so you just put your seatbelts on, and here we go. <laughs> More than half of all couples living together are not married. Several states permit same-sex marriages. Just because it's permitted don't mean the Bible approves of it. Amen. Spouses swap partners. Dear Lord Jesus. If my buddy can't get along with her, why would I want <laughs> Come on, you can, you can, you can laugh, but it, it's the truth. Many groups of married couples are what's called swingers. I'm not going into detail there. Families are often made up of any combination of people who choose to cohabitate. Now, I could go on further with that, but there's a word to be shared here. What is our response to the news that the nuclear family is rapidly losing ground? First of all, I believe we have to begin by purposely or purposefully working toward our Christian ideals without demanding of each other or of everyone absolute perfection. You're not perfect. Your partner is not going to be perfect. And your kid sure ain't going to be perfect because two imperfect people don't make a perfect kid. That's just the way it goes. And the church is not perfect because you're a member of it. And I'm the pastor of this one. We are not perfect, but we're going to preach the truth. Hallelujah. Like it or not. Ideals our goals toward which that we work for. They're not the absolute performance standards that everybody has to meet every day. Jesus gave His ideal in the text that I shared with you this morning as He shared and described the intention of God for human existence. Amen. How did you get here? Well, God created me. Amen. And you're right. But you got here because a man and a woman chose to get together. Are you with me? Yeah. Oh, Pastor you can't even say it. <laughs> you got here because a man and a woman chose to get together, and you're what king. <laughs> I remember my children being born. And I remember how excited I was. Yeah. How happy I was. Amen. And I thank God for that. Amen. Thank God for that. But that's how God designed it. Now, uh -huh. mm. here's God's intention. He created us male and female for the purpose of fulfilling each other's lives. Even if you don't, even if you don't have children, it doesn't mean your life can't be fulfilled. <clears throat> this arrangement leads to the establishment of a family in which two people commit themselves to each other for life. Amen. Not until we get divorced. Like one couple wanted me to put in their marriage vows. <clears throat> Could you take out that till death we do part and put until we get divorced? I said, I'm not performing this marriage if you do that. 
And you know they got upset with me? One less wedding. <laughs> Their commitment to each other is a sacred covenant. It's under God. It's entered into to accomplish the purposes of God for their lives. And with this ideal clearly in front of us, with the dire pronouncements on current family life, what do we do? As I was thinking about this, and a lot of people are battling all different kinds of med medical problems. And some of you who are in the medical field know what a blood transfusion is. And even if you're not in the medical field, you may have experienced it at one time or another. Yes. I believe with all my heart, that's what society needs right now, Brother Dennis, Amen. is a blood transfusion. Mm -hmm. A continuous blood transfusion through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't say this in hate. I say this in all love because Christ loves us even in our sin. And there's not a person in here that doesn't sin. You're not beyond temptation. And you're not beyond sin. We all fail. Amen. I want to look at three transfusions for you. We're going to go to the hospital for a little bit. And I want to look at three transfusions. And I hope and pray you receive it. Here's the first one. There must be a strong spirit of commitment in the family. Now there's that C word. Commitment. This is why some people don't want to get married. I don't want the commitment. But you're going to live together. Are you committed to them? Oh yeah, I love them. I love them. Absolutely, I love them. But I just, you know, you know, the marriage, the marriage license is nothing but a piece of paper, Pastor Don. And you know what? In, hu in human thinking and comprehension, you're absolutely right. But see, my Bible says that he created this male and female and, and then the man will leave his mother and his father. Yes. And he will cleave unto his wife. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And they become, they become one. Yeah. And you may or may not have children. And I battle this a lot of times with, with when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm talking and counseling because some people feel like that they're, as, as a married couple, their marriage is not fulfilled unless they have kids. That's a lie from the pit of hell. A child does not bring fulfillment. The fulfillment takes place in your commitment to one another. To me, the child is the absolute blessing. Amen. Now I know some of you. Oh, yeah. oh, oh. <laughs> you had to be sorry when you had to be sorry when you were young. Your child might be okay. Amen. <laughs> God help us. But let's go back to this C word since this, this just kind of seems to upset everybody. There must be a strong spirit of contentment, or of commitment in the family and contentment. <laughs> many are denying, many are decrying the need for commitment. They're saying that commitment is totally out of place in any marriage arrangement. In fact, people don't even... People don't need to consider marriage at all. They're saying commitment only leads to problems. Commitment denies freedom. You know where I got some of the stuff I'm sharing with you? Our fearless leader in the White House. Oh. Does that mean you agree with him? No. No. I agree with this. But this is what's being hammered into our kids and into our families. And some people are celebrating it. 
In current thought, that means today, the only criteria for continuing marriage or family is whether it is a presently satisfactory relationship. If it's not, <laughs> see this moment, the moment approach to marriage and the family gives it no permanence or stability. Amen. The attitude created by the lack of commitment is that if marriage gets uncomfortable, a person should get out and get out immediately. That's what's being shared. Some of your friends, some of my friends, when my wife had almost had a nervous breakdown in between kids, Jeremy just about finished her off. <laughs> but I'm serious. Something changes in the woman's system with pregnancy and all. This, this was prophesied in the Bible back in Genesis as the woman gives birth. It's not just painful. You research in that pain and see what goes with it. There are changes that take place in the woman. What was designed as a blessing? Having children. Sin tried to curse. I've got a lot to say today, and we're not having a PM service. <laughs> I've, I've got to go to Orlando to a ministry meeting, but I'm going to get through with this, I'll tell you that. Get out immediately. Get out. I have friends. Friends! That I played ball and said, you need to divorce her. You can get rid of her. Me? You don't have to live like that. And all I can say is, I, that ain't an option, man. Right. Marry. I didn't marry her until things get rough. You can say, Pastor Donnie, you better have stood with her because you wouldn't have found nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been a contestant on the back. <laughs> and after I preach this, I might have to be. <laughs> but get out immediately. Just because you're having problems. Let me tell each one of you what will happen if you'll stick together when you're having a problem. And if you'll work together. Your marriage will become stronger. <laughs> I remember when Jeremy had his six spinal fusions. And Wendy, you can receive this, lady. When Jeremy had his six spinal fusions, that doctor told me the last visit we had as he checked Jeremy. And he said, he said, man, again, pastor, I tell you, bigger hands than mine worked on this young man. Bigger hands than mine worked on this young man. His back. His spine is stronger than it's ever been in his entire life. But it had to go through trauma. It had to go through an operation. It had to go through repair. But now it's stronger than it's ever been. Hallelujah. I can tell you today, that young lady that I married back in 1977, our unity, our, our, our commitment to one another is stronger now than it's ever been. And I thank God for it. The church will not come between us. No. That's a given. You say, well, Pastor Donnie, I really need to talk to you. It might be the day of my anniversary. Pardon me, your problem will have to wait. Amen. Come on. Come on, well, Pastor Donnie, that means I'm not a priority at that time? No. Amen. You miss church for your anniversary. Come on! Oh, pastor. It's the truth. You miss church for a toy. You miss church because you're anticipating a headache. And some people miss church because they're anticipating a rough Monday. And I'm praying you have one. I'm kidding. This lack of commitment is most clearly seen in the norm 
of couples living together before marriage. Another way it is seen is in the recent development of marriage contracts. Contracts? <laughs> By which a couple may opt out of marriage. <laughs> Come on, you know where I got this one. They may opt out of marriage with no penalties after a set length of time. Till death you are part is passe. These trends assume that couples have no responsibility for maintaining or continuing the family. The family is to be continued only so long as both parties are pleased by the arrangement. Let me tell you something. One of the things that God put in every man and every woman is moods. <laughs> and on a certain day, when mama ain't happy, and daddy ain't happy, and the kids are staying as far away from the house as they can, you may want to bail out. But you better remember, the job you love has bad days. Yeah, but it pays good. All right, get, stick with me here. That marriage, it may have bad days, but oh, it's the pay good. I talked with one guy just a couple of weeks ago, told him what, I, what I'm speaking on and where I'm going with some of these things and everything, and he said, sometimes, I, me and my wife like to just get mad at each other so we can make up. Right? I'm like, okay, I do not need to hear that. But I know what he looks like and I know what she looks like. to commit yourself to one another in love and to help that person 
and oneself grow together toward God. See, because society says, don't do it, it'll take courage of individuality for Christians to begin learning what it is to make marriage and family commitment a meaningful experience. Many people spend so much money on the wedding, they're already in financial <coughs> trouble before the first year. And the first year is the toughest. I had one couple that I talked with for a length of time who had been living together and said they never had any problems. But they came to church. And because of my preaching, they got under conviction. And so they decided to get married. To please God. And then they came back to my office and said, Pastor, it was so much better when we weren't married. Look what you got us into. I said, Oh, yeah, I walked you down the aisle. I twisted your arm. I had you in a headlock. Absolutely. <laughs> it's my fault. You know what the problem is? When you got married, God was there. As long as you, as long as you were living together, the devil was there, and you were serving him. You were doing exactly what he wanted you to do, and so it was like you didn't have any problem. But you start taking a stand for Christ. You start taking a stand for Christ, and I tell you right now, the enemy will raise that ugly head. And he will do everything he can to torment you. And he does not want you to be happy. And so then you can turn around and blame it on Pastor Don. And I told him, it's all right. I got big shoulders. I'll take the blame. But I know what my Bible says and I'll preach the truth. Jesus was talking about the ideal for commit of commitment when he quoted the words of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 is quoted in verse 7 of today's text. It says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. It doesn't say here will leave her and become united to his job. Or to anyone else. But there's another principle here that I want to show you. Number two. Bring it up, son. We must inhale. Does anybody know what inhale means? <laughs> All right. We must inhale the atmosphere of the church for the family. The atmosphere of the church. Oh, get this. We can say with indisputable evidence on our side, every family that's serious about its survival and its health will find its place in the church. Some of you may agree or disagree with what I'm fixing to say concerning this specific point. But I stand behind it because it's true. Families need survival kits for marriage in the jungle of America, the American society today. And some places in society actually offer survival kits. <coughs> this is what you need. Yes, this is what you need. Every problem you'll ever have in a marriage is covered in that book right there. Everyone. Three leading causes of divorce in America. Communication, sex, and money. And if you're having a problem with money, you're not communicating. If you're having a problem with sex, you ain't communicating. Right. Amen? Yeah. So, looks like you don't have to communicate. Yeah. Mm. Those kits, those survival kits must include instructions of how to get into and be a part of a growing church fellowship. I'll give you just a little example here. Counseling with a with a young couple, young man used to attend our church, 
when he was a teenager. His parents got mad at me and left. And he actually apologized to me here in the office for his parents being the way they were. They were. Because I asked him, why did you come to me for counseling? Your parents hate my guts. I said, Pastor, you shouldn't have said that. It's in my heart, and that's what I said. And he said, because I've never heard anything but the truth come from you, Pastor Tom. I need your help. And I talked to him. And the only way that his wife or live in <laughs> would agree to come as if I told them I would not preach to them. Now who are you coming to <laughs> But I promised. I said I will not preach. I will talk very firm. <laughs> and I shared some things with them. They asked me some questions. She was raised Jehovah's Witness. And as I shared with them things that didn't sound like they were coming from the Bible. I'm serious. It didn't sound, it wasn't King James Version, so they didn't recognize it. Because they've been out of church. She was raised Jehovah's Witness and she's listening to this. Tears start streaming down her face. And before they're getting up to walk out of my office, she says, when you preach, do you talk like this? <laughs> I said, maybe not exactly, but I can tell you this. I am who I am, lady. I don't have a preacher's tone of voice. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't have a preacher's tone of voice. What you see is what you get. And you ain't seen nothing yet. But I am who I am. I am who I am. And if you, don't, if, if, if you can't accept that, well, too bad. I'm not going to change my tone of voice back behind the pulpit. This is who God called. This is who He's got. And she said, I think I might enjoy that. And I said, well, come on. Well, we've got some things we've got to correct first. Partner, listen to me. I didn't have to say anything. Brother Brandon, they start, they were under conviction. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. If you if you want to avoid conviction, don't go to a preacher for counsel. <laughs> However, the Holy Spirit can go anywhere. And when that secular counselor starts sharing the truth with you, it's just likely the Holy Spirit is going to come in there and say, you know, you need to correct some things. Mm. Families need to breathe the air of spiritual worship every week if they're going to be strong. See, worship and praise on a church service Puts me in a good mood usually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. And many times, if I could just leave and go out the door, get my truck and leave, I'd stay in a good mood. But sometimes, in between here <laughs> and out there, and the parking lot, and the gym, and everywhere else, the mood changes. I felt the love of Jesus, but now I've got the spirit of slap. <laughs> Go on, you say, you say, you say, Pastor, that ain't right. You feel it too. Some of you argued all the way to church. Pastor, did you ride with us? <laughs> no, but I know who did. See, families are constantly exposed to forces from the outside that want to destroy them. These forces include such things as affluence, personal success, mm. moral decay, vocational pressure, a mass of lifestyle options from which a person can choose also helps to deteriorate the family. 
On the other hand, there are fewer strengths within the family. A husband's income is often no longer sufficient to support a family. Thus, women often must work outside the home while the children are cared for by a non-family member or daycare. The church is one of the few remaining strengthening groups for family life. The bar substitutes. See, I had a lot of friends that said one of the main reasons they went to the bar was because of the fellowship, the camaraderie, the friendship, and everything. There's no, there's no condemnation. I mean, everybody's, everybody's fighting different battles. And I, and I agree with this. Everybody's fighting different battles. They're drinking and everything and just they're laughing. And, and some people enjoy the bar scene more than they do home. Yeah. That's the truth. <coughs> Pastor, are you encouraging it today? No, I'm not. I'm telling you right now, I have no desire to spend time in a bar. And I'm telling you right now, God has not called me to go sit in a bar and witness to people. Well, you've got to go where they are. Well, you know what? This is the way I feel. I feel like if they're in trouble, they know where the church is. So you wouldn't go to a bar. I can promise you this. If the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, you need, to, you need to go to that bar, and you need to park there, and you need to go inside, and you need to witness, I would. But let me tell you what else would happen. One of you would see my gray Dodge Ram. I'm serious. Parked at that bar. And you Amen. would get on the phone. It's where Pastor Donnie is. I'm serious. One pastor friend of mine that was here for many, many years went to a strip club to minister to a young lady who was a stripper. And he wound up having to leave his church. You say, well, he shouldn't put himself in that kind of environment. But this is coming from some of the same people that say, you don't care about them if you don't go to them. So there's a, it's a no-win situation. Amen. That's right. <laughs> If families would make time for church participation as much as they do for other things, oh, nothing's going to interfere with Little League. Nothing's going to interfere with your activities, things that you want to do. Because all of you have lives. And see, I'm going to just say this. <coughs> People ask me all the time, Pastor Donnie, I, I, I really need a job where I can make more money. Or I just need a job. Pastor Donnie, will you help me pray? And I do. But more times than one, God has provided a job for that individual. And then all of a sudden it seems like the Lord is blessing the job. That's just God. And sometimes I have to work six days a week. And if I ever have to work six days a week, this is what some of the men tell me. If I ever have to work six days a week, I will not be at church on Sunday because I need family time. And if God's upset about that, that's just too bad. Brother Dennis, this is the same God that they wanted to seek whenever they needed a job whenever they needed income. And last time I checked, when you work Saturdays, it's overtime. Unless, right? So you're asking the Lord to bless you with more money. You're asking the Lord to take care of those needs, which means you have to spend more time working. But then you're going to say, I'm not coming to church. Let me tell you something. And I'm going to put this in words like I grew up with. 
You better watch out biting the hands and feet. Amen. When you pray and you ask God to do something and then He does it, and then you want to sit your lazy bohonkers at home on, on Sunday and you don't want to worship Him and you don't want to exalt Him and thank Him, <coughs> give me a break. I'm not God, but do you think I'd want to do anything for you? You unappreciative. It's the truth. You want Him to bless you, and then it won't, then it's got to be on your terms. So now you've got the job. Now you've got the money. Now you hold the cards. Can I tell you something right now? He can take that job from you just as quick as He gets it to And then you'll be coming right back to me. I sentence you to three services a week for the rest of your life. <laughs> We're always pleased when there's enough money coming in to add another room to the house, expand the house, modernize the house. Sometimes families add a room even when they don't have enough money to do it. That's called credit. Isn't it amazing that many people will spend all kinds of time and money improving their houses so they can resell them, but they won't give the church any time to improve their home. A house is only a house until it becomes a home. Amen. You've endured just about enough. So let me leave you with this. The third necessity for saving the family is the infusion of Christ into every functioning part of the family. Hear me. Every part that moves must have the strength of Christ flowing through it. The creator of family, God, creator of family life, is also the keeper of family life. See, there's maintenance involved. When you buy a new vehicle, you drive it off the lot, you never have to go back for an oil change, right? You never have to change it. Come on, I'm here. You never have to change the oil. You never have to check the air in your tires. You'll never have to do a thing to drive. You know better than that. There's maintenance involved. When you give your life to Christ, when you give your life to Christ, there's maintenance involved. Amen. If you want this life to be successful. You can't give your life to Christ and quit going to church, quit reading your Bible, quit praying. You can't do that. No. <laughs> kind of like what I told you last week, or, or Wednesday night, whenever, whenever I was speaking. The lady got upset because, some of you weren't here, so I'll repeat it for you. The lady got upset because her diet, her exercise program wasn't working. The company that sold it to her guaranteed that it would work. And she went to them, wanted her money back because she had actually gained weight. They checked her attendance at the exercise class and with the purchase of the dietary goods, she had only done it twice. <laughs> are, you, are, are you hearing me? Anybody know what a diet is? It's the word die with a tombstone at the end of it. D I E T. That, that T is, is your tombstone. What it means is you have got to die to certain things right. in order to be healthy. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. You've got to die. God's got to take the desire from it. <laughs> away of the desire for it. Away from you. I, I love love the diet. My nephew's on one. He's lost, I think it's 60 something pounds. 
And he said, but one day a week, I get to splurge. And I said, what day is that? And he said, Sunday. I said, you know what? That diet would work for me. <laughs> that diet would work for me because Sunday, I'm going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, so I don't have a whole lot of time to eat. Okay. I'm just... Yeah. See, my problem is I only eat one meal a day. From the time I get up to the time I go to bed. Sometimes I'm eating because I'm dealing with people's problems. <laughs> I'm kidding. Let me finish this. Social scientists today are looking for a new arrangement to replace family life. Come on. I, I told you where I got a lot of this material. Many experiments think they found it in a variety of arrangements. Folks, we don't need a new arrangement. We need new people. Social scientists, for the most part, are treating the symptoms instead of the cause of the failure of the marriage and the family. Christ changes people. He puts new blood in the veins of a marriage. He helps us find the purposes of God in marriage. Every day that a family lives together, it needs the Lord's presence. It needs the presence of Christ to learn how to forgive, to learn how to share meaningfully with others, to learn how to accept others by being accepted themselves. It needs the presence of Christ to learn how to love, not selfishly, but givingly. And to learn how to trust others so they too will be built up. Jesus' parable of the houses. Anybody remember, if you, were, if you were in church when you were a kid, there was a little old song that we sung from time to time. Wise man built his house upon the rock. Wise man, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then it says, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Some of you just learned something. <laughs> <laughs> this comes right out of Scripture. Jesus' parable of the houses on the rock and on the sand was never more appropriate than for 2013. Day. A home falls not because necessarily the sinkholes and all the problems, not because homes will not stand anymore, but it's because they're built on the wrong foundation. Amen. Your home cannot stand the way God designed it without His help. Christ is needed in your home. You want it to last? You want your home to be meaningful? You want your kids to be proud to come home? Can I tell you something? My kids left home, and I'm glad they're happily married. It's quiet around the house <coughs> until Jonah and Dylan sing praises. It's quiet around the house. But this, I'm, I'm going to tell you this right here. They both got a key to my house. And they can come there anytime they need to. Amen. Are you here? Are you, are you listening to me? Yes. Why? Because I'm dad. Amen. The whole family's welcome. <laughs> <laughs> The whole family is welcome. Seriously, you hear me? Because, because, I'm dead. And I want you to be happy. And I want to help you get over a tough time, whatever may happen. But I said that to say this. See, this is my dad. God, my dad. <clears throat> because when I lost both parents, I told God, what am I going to do? And my God told me, I'll be your mom and dad. Yeah. 
And I have, my friend. <coughs> I ain't perfect, and I never will be. But this I know. He knows how to take care of me, but yeah. Yeah. He knows how to slap me. <laughs> he knows how to calm me down. Amen. He knows how to provide when I ain't got nothing. <coughs> and I ain't, I ain't standing here poor mountain. Partner, I have been blessed beyond measure. So see, I used to wear a 32 pant. <laughs> <laughs> These are still 32s. They, they just got a plastic in them. <laughs> <laughs> see, the good of our homes is one of the most compelling reasons for responding to Christ. It's not about you. It's not just about you. It will help you. But who who else is it going to help? It's going to help your spouse. Yeah. It's going to help your kids. Yeah. It's going to help your co-workers. They're going to see yeah. a different person. Hallelujah. And they're going to ask you, why, why aren't you mad on Mondays anymore? <laughs> well, I've just been to the filling station. Amen. Amen. God gives us something that we can build on if we're letting guide us. Here's the question I want you to take a look at right here. <clears throat> Do you care enough about your home to let Christ change your life for His purpose? I want you to think about something here with our musicians come. I'm, I'm the happiest trailer of trash that's ever been in existence. Amen. Let me tell you something. I don't care what kind of house you live in. Pardon my grammar here, but it ain't a home until the Lord moves in. Amen. 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 I always said when I was a kid coming up, there's one, there's one thing or one place that I will never live, and that's a house trailer. I ain't gonna live in a house trailer. Then I went to work for Homes of America, mobile home factory in Bartow, and I learned that they're not house trailers. They're manufactured. I almost got fired from my job on my first day because I argued with my boss. You will not refer to manufactured housing. As a house trip. I looked at him and I said, it's got a trailer hitch. <laughs> it's got a frame. It's got wheels. And it's got taillights. <laughs> it's, it's a house trailer. He said, okay. I can't argue with you. I can tell it's going to be an experience when you work through it. <laughs> but please don't refer to it when customers are walking through the plant <laughs> and seeing how we build them. <laughs> Folks, listen. When we dismiss this service today, you may go out and you may have a nice meal with mom and celebrate her. But listen to me, you don't just celebrate her today. Celebrate her every day. Because without her, all oh, the house is hurting. Dirty socks everywhere. <laughs> I'm kidding. I hope I am anyway. See, the home is not complete without us, but especially without them. And no matter where you live, 
be thankful for what you have because it's only been just a few weeks that we looked on those slides on this screen and we saw a trash dump and we saw people living in cardboard homes and we saw people living in holes and when you walk in your home this afternoon and the climate in your home is cool and it's 90 degrees outside are you with me and some people in Florida still choose to go to hell. Are you kidding me? You live in this heat and then you still want to go to hell? Uh, I thank God. Thank God. Every time I walk by that thermostat, I say, keep on, baby. <laughs> keep on doing your work. Because the bacon start to fry. <laughs> Can the family be saved? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. What's your heart's desire? Do you care enough? <laughs> Mom, Dad, I'm speaking to you. Do you care enough? There's a lot more messages to come on this. And it's going to get tough. But I can promise you this. If you will endure with me, the truths that come out of this word will make your family, if you will, live by the principles that I'm sharing with you, it will make your family stronger than it's ever been. Amen. We're not putting a band-aid on it. We're rebuilding. Band-aids, they just work for a period of time. But we want Father, in the Jesus' name.